Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today we're going to hear from the inquiries expert on cause and origin of the fire. Yes, Thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor Corps, Professor Neve Nick Dade. Thank you. Sincerely and truly, declare and affirm, declare and affirm that, the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Professor. Sit down and make yourself comfortable there. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, Mr. Kinnear. Thanks, sir. Uh, First of all, would you please confirm your name for the record? Uh, my name is Neve Sinead Nick Date. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for coming today to give evidence. It's much appreciated. Now, you have provided two reports, a preliminary report dated the 29th of March of this year and a final report dated the 1st of November of this year. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Now, uh, we uh, dealt with the preliminary report uh, when you gave evidence previously, so I won't rehearse those matters again. But is it right that your final report sets out your final conclusions regarding A, the cause and origin of the initial fire within Flat 16 on the 14th of June 2017, and B, the spread of the fire once ignited within the flat itself? That's correct, yes. Thank you. Now, in terms of your final report, are the factual matters you've set out there true to the best of your knowledge and belief? To the best of my knowledge and belief, yes. Thank you. And does your final report set out your opinions in relation to the matters relevant to this inquiry? Yes, it does. And finally, you've provided this report in the same way you would have done had it been a report for a court of law. Is That's that correct? Right? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Professor, if we could first deal with your qualifications and background, and for people's reference, in section three, that's it, page four of your final report, and appendix two, uh, you outline your background and the experience relevant to uh, the matters you're dealing with in this inquiry. I'm not going to go through this, but would like to pick out the following details with you. Um, first of all, you are currently the director of the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And you've held a chair in forensic science at the University of Dundee since 2014? Correct. Uh, between 2011 and 2014, you held a chair in forensic science at the University of Strathclyde? Yes, that's correct. And in 2017, you became a chartered chemist? Yes. As to fellowships, you're a fellow of a number of learned societies, uh, primarily the Royal Society of Edinburgh? Yes, that's correct. The Royal Society of Chemistry? Yes. The Chartered so Society for Forensic Science? Yes. And the Institute of Chemistry of Ireland? Yes. Now, amongst other prizes you've uh, been awarded during career, in 2018, is it right that you were awarded the Distinguished Forensic Scientist Award by the European Network of Forensic Science Institutes? That's correct, yes. And in 2016, you were awarded the Pete Gancy Award for Service to Fire Investigation by the UKAFI, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Can you help us? What does UKAFI stand for? It stands for the UK Association of Fire Investigators. It is the professional body for fire investigators in the UK. Thank you. Now, in relation to your other professional um, relevant experience, is it right that you're currently the Vice Chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the International Criminal Court? Yes, that's true. And between 2013 and 16, you were the Chair of Interpol's Forensic Science Managers Symposium? Correct. Between 2012 and 2015, you were the chair of the ENFSI Investigation Working Group, is that right? It's, it was the Fire Investigation Working Group of ENSFI, which is the European Network of Forensic Science Institutes. Thank you. Uh, and is it right that you're the committee lead in the development of the UK National Code of Practice for Fire Scene Investigations? Yes, that's true. And finally, you're a member of the steering committee for the development and publication of judicial primers? Yes, correct. And that involves what exactly? Um, the judicial primers are a project that were led by the senior judiciary in England and Wales, so by the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, in collaboration with um, the two national academies, the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And the uh, uh, role of the primers is to present um, the known position for a scientific discipline, DNA, for example, um, written by the leaders in the field and ratified by the councils of the national academies in order to uh, facilitate an understanding by the judiciary of what the current uh, accepted science in that particular area is. 
Professor, thank you. Now, before I turn to examination on the topics contained in your final report, I should give a general warning to those in the room and watching elsewhere that a number of the photographs within your report that we will be looking at during the course of this morning uh, will show images of burnt out scenes, and some people may find these distressing. When I come up to particular photos, I shall endeavour to give a warning, but at the outset, could I just make that general note for everyone watching? Now, Professor, the first topic I'd like to um, cover with you is uh, really in order to orientate everyone as to what the layout of the flat is. And first of all, if I could ask Ralph uh, to draw up page 25 of your final report, uh, the reference which is double NDS triple zero, that's it. And that is uh, figure 11. Now, first of all, does the flat 16 mark there in red in the top right hand corner that identifies flat 16, is that right? Yes, that's right. Thank you. And on the same page, Ralph, if we can go to figure 12. Uh, this is a plan that you've drawn, I think, of the flat 16 itself. Uh, it's a plan that I've taken from the previous figure and annotated so that I've labelled up the different rooms in the flat. Thank you. And uh, as we see, um, we have the kitchen in the bottom right-hand corner, the kitchen window identified on the far right side, and then the living room to the north of the kitchen. Correct. Ralph, thank you. If we can now look at the layout of the kitchen of flat 16, if we can turn to figure 13 on page 26. First of all, just to confirm, that's your approximation of the likely internal layout of the kitchen in flat 16, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And if you could enable us to understand uh, on what basis, what evidence have you relied upon for uh, placing the various appliances where they're identified in this plan? Um, the different uh, appliances and their positions were presented in the diagram on the basis of uh, witness testimony from Mr. Kabidi and from the other um, uh, occupants of the flat, and also from uh, the contempor contemporaneous notes of the fire investigators, um, and also finally from um, the information that was available within the thermal imaging camera videos uh, of um, the first firefighters that went in. Uh, the final uh, aspect of it was um, looking at the photographs that were taken by the first fire investigators who documented the scene. Thank you. Now, in your report, you advanced three hypotheses, and just so that people are aware of what those hypotheses are, hypothesis one is that the fire in the tower started in the kitchen of flat 16 as opposed to any other flat in the tower. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Hypothesis two is that the fire started in the southeast end of the kitchen of flat 16 as opposed to elsewhere within the kitchen. Correct. And when we talk about the southeast end, uh, what we're talking about is the end where the uh, kitchen window, approximate position of the extractor fan, the tall fridge freezer, the cooker end of the kitchen. Yes, that's correct. And finally, hypothesis three is that it's more likely than not that the fire starts in the southeast corner in the tall fridge freezer as opposed to any other appliance or item in the southeast corner of the kitchen of flat 16. Correct. Thank you. Right, if we can first turn to hypothesis one. Now, uh, Ralph, if I could ask you to uh, show Professor Nick Dade paragraph 8.8 Point 11, which is at page 66 of the final report. And here you state your conclusion that, and I quote, all of the witness statements from the firefighters, fire service personnel, and occupants of flat 16 provide strong evidence that the fire in Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June 2017 started in the kitchen of flat 16. My first question is, does that remain your view? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Now, can we look briefly at the evidence upon which you've relied in reaching this conclusion? Now, the first category of evidence is the evidence of Mr. Kabedi and the other two occupants of Flat 16. Is that a fair summary? Uh, yes, that is. And could I ask Ralph to put up on the screen uh, paragraph 8.2.2 at page 23 of the final report? Now, here you set out... Uh, the relevant extracts from a 999 call made by Mr. Kabedi at 054. Is that right? Yes. And where he says there, uh, fire in flat 16 Grenfell Tower, the fridge flat 16 Grenfell Tower, that's the evidence upon which you've relied from that phone call? Yes. Thank 
It, it was the first phone call that was, um, to my knowledge, recorded by the London Fire Brigade. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, if you could put that uh, amplification down and take us to page 65, and first of all, of the final report. Now, here at paragraphs 8.8.5 onwards, and turning over the page to page 66, is it right that you've set out what you consider to be the relevant extracts from the witness statements of the former occupants of Flat 16, which are pertinent to Hypothesis 1? Yes. And can you draw out for us what you consider to be the key elements of the evidence upon which you've relied? And the key elements here are the witness's um, statement relating to what he saw once the smoke alarm um, in the flat woke him up. Uh, so he reports, um, having gone into his kitchen or looked inside the kitchen, um, what he saw in regards to smoke within the kitchen area and then his direct actions following that observation, which was to wake his, his, uh, the other people in the flat um, and to, to exit the flat uh, to try to wake up uh, his neighbours and also to call the fire service. Thank you. Now, the second category of evidence you rely upon is the evidence of the first responders. Is that a fair summary? Yes. And if I could ask Ralph to take us to page 31 of your final report. And paragraph 8.5.11. Uh, here you summarise the evidence of crew manager Charles Batterby, and in which he said he opened the door to the right leading into the kitchen of flat 16 at approximately yes. 0114, and you describe the temperature change to be significant. And thereon, you see the evidence quoted. If you could deamplify that, Ralph. And identify the paragraph 8.5.13. You have the evidence of firefighter Daniel Brown, who describes flame within. That's correct, flat yes. Flat 16. And if that could be deamplified, Ralph. And if you could amplify paragraph 8.5.19 on page 35. And there we go. You've summarized the evidence of firefighters O'Hanlon and Barton, but primarily O'Hanlon, in which they identify the scene that they witnessed uh, when they attended flat 16. Is that right? Uh, yes, I, I think the sequence here is important. So when um, the first firefighters, Battery and Brown, entered the flat, they searched the flat initially, um, and the only place where they found evidence of burning was in the kitchen, having searched the rest of the property. If I could stop you there, it may help you, um, Professor. Ralph, could you de-amplify page 35 and go back to page 31? And on this page, essentially, you set out the key relevant evidence that you've relied upon for the initial stages of the, that, the very correct. first first responders search. That, that's correct. Thank you. Now, the third category of evidence um, you cite in the report is the footage from the thermal image cameras held by the first responders. Is that right? Yes. Now, Ralph, if I can ask you to turn to page 32 of the report, and in particular, figure 19. Uh, Professor, I think we dealt with these um, stills when you gave evidence back in June, but I think it would be useful if you could talk us through uh, A, B, and C in that order, what they show and what you derive from them. So what you're looking at is on the left-hand side um, of the photographs is an unmarked up um, uh, image. That's the image that was directly taken from the thermal imaging camera. On the right-hand side corresponding to each of those photographs, so for A, B, and C, um, I've placed what I believe to be the positioning of some of the appliances that were within the kitchen. Um, if we take photograph A first, or the two photographs connected with A first, this was the first, um, this was the thermal imaging, thermal image, I beg your pardon, captured by the TIC when the firefighters opened the kitchen door for what we understand to be the first time. So that was at 14 minutes past one in the morning, uh, according to the times that we um, have agreed. What you see is, um, looking down the photograph, perhaps if I can stand up and, yes, please and do, look please at do. them, it might be easier. Sorry about that. All right, don't worry. 
Um, so what you see on the first photograph, this is looking from the kitchen door. This is, I believe, to be the edge of the door. And Professor, if I could just stop you there, just for the transcript, what you're pointing to is uh, figure uh, 19A on yes. the top left-hand photo. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the, the bit that I believe to be part of the door is the black line on the uh, right-hand side of the photograph. As you look down into the room, you see a yellow glow down towards the end. Thermal imaging cameras show uh, different colours by changing, sorry, different temperatures by changing the colour. So while it looks like a yellow go glow, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a flame. It just simply means it's a higher temperature. Um, so as you look down this, this, um, the room, this is what the firefighters would have seen. Uh, my interpretation of some of the somewhat grainy images within the photograph is that here, which is about the middle of the photograph, there's a, 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 an almost a, a shaded rounded area with um, an outline around it, which I interpret to be the washing machine, uh, and then beside it a tall object that's blocking um, the, uh, the increased colour, if you like, on the TIC, which I believe to be the fridge freezer. And if we look at the top right-hand uh, image, you've there drawn in a dotted red line what you consider to be the tall fridge freezer and next to it the washing machine, is that yes. right? Yes. Now, the, we know that the washing machine and the tall fridge freezer weren't beside each other, but as you look down the, uh, the room, the, mm. the positioning of the various appliances are distorted slightly, no. as just in terms of how you viewed the, the room. Thank you. If we could now move down to figure 19B for Bravo, what does the middle left-hand photo show us? So in figure 19, we're now, we've now uh, moved on by about 15 seconds only. So this was the second opening of the door um, by the firefighters. And again, looking, you're, you're looking from the doorway, they haven't entered the room yet, and you're looking down towards the, uh, the window end of the property, or of the kitchen. Uh, what you can observe is that the temperature has increased, or at least the spread of the temperature has increased um, from the previous photograph. Um, and again, I've placed some of the appliances in terms of where I, I have interpreted them to be. And your interpretation of the location of the appliances is shown in the middle right-hand box. That's correct. And Professor, if I could ask you to turn to the bottom uh, two images, so that's figure 19C, what does the bottom left-hand image show us? So now we're, again, this is the third opening of the door. Um, so in between each, the firefighters closed the door, awaited a small amount of time and then reopened them. This was about a minute after <coughs> the figures B, or the images in figure B. And here the firefighters are looking at the um, fire at the end of the room from a different angle. So we're no longer looking directly along, we're now looking upwards into the corner. So what you're seeing is the top of the appliances as opposed to the entire length of the appliance or as much as the length as we could see. Um, so we're looking up into the, into the uh, top corner, if you like, or top portion of the room. The black line on the right hand side is again the door of the kitchen um, and my interpretation of where the tall fridge freezer is indicated uh, on figure C to the right. That's, I'm grateful for that. Professor, Professor, if you wouldn't mind staying standing, and if I ask Ralph if you wouldn't mind turning to <coughs> page 34 and figure 21. Professor, again, if we could go through um, each of these images. First of all, though, a general question, what do these images show? Um, these images are now, the firefighters have now moved into the, the kitchen, so these are no longer from the doorway. Um, they've moved into the kitchen, and while one of the firefighters, I believe it to be uh, Firefighter Batterby, was um, tackling the fire in the fridge freezer, um, Firefighter Brown was, was looking at um, the rest of the window end of uh, the kitchen using the thermal imaging camera, and that's what these images depict. Thank you. I interrupted you. If we could start in the top left-hand corner, we have figure 21A. What does this image show us in your interpretation? Um, figure 21A um, is looking at the top, would be west-hand corner of the kitchen window. Um, uh, so the the, the large kitchen window is on uh, this side, on the left-hand side. The smaller kitchen window with the infill panel above it, with the extractor fan, is on the right-hand side. Um, and what this uh, photograph is showing is a thermal imaging camera's image of just what was happening around that area um, just after the firefighters had entered the room. So about a minute after the firefighters had entered the room. And if we move over, looking at little B for Bravo, um, 
again, it's an image of the kitchen window, I think. What can be seen through that window in your, in your view? Um, so the images here are, um, some of them are, are, are replicants of each other. This one is showing you now where the, the edge of the window frame is. And what, you, uh, what appears to be in evidence is materials dropping down uh, from or, or, um, across the window, uh, on the outside of the window. And again, is it much the same view that's identified in the stills at little c, little d and little e? Yes. Uh, Professor, thank you very much. Um, Ralph, you can put those down. Now, Professor, it looks uh, from your report that the fourth category of evidence that you've relied upon is footage actually taken by Mr. Kabedi himself. Is that, is, is that right? Yes. And um, if I could ask Ralph to put up page 39 of your final report and figure 25. Uh, now, first of all, can you confirm for us uh, uh, what these shots are? Um, these are photographs that were taken, uh, still images taken from um, uh, mi video material that was recovered from Mr. Kabidi's uh, mobile telephone, and they are taken from outside of Grenfell Tower, looking up towards Flat 16. Thank you. And can you help us? What have you deduced? Uh, what can you deduce from these uh, screenshots? So the videos follow a sequence, as you can see by the timing, and really what I was trying to capture was just the um, development of the fire around about the, uh, the kitchen area of uh, the, sorry, the window of the kitchen of flat 16 and what uh, appears to be um, happening is that the area around where the extractor fan is um, appears to be burning and that as that uh, burning is progressing um, that the fire is exiting or beginning to exit outside of the kitchen of flat 16. And the kitchen extractor fan, if we look at little c, uh, is the, am I right in understanding it's identified by the large white arrow? That's correct. Yeah. And if we move along to the screenshot at little e, which is timed at 0108.18, what does the top arrow indicate? And the top arrow is, my, my, my interpretation of the photograph is that it's indicating flames now starting to come out uh, from the window on the um, right-hand side of the window as you look up. And the middle arrow? And the middle arrow and the arrow beneath it are uh, pointing out what appears to be debris falling from the window. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, you can put that uh, image down there. Um, Professor, the fifth and final category of evidence that you appear to rely upon um, for reaching your conclusions with respect to hypothesis one appears to be the evidence of the occupant of flat nine. Is that correct? <coughs> Now, um, Ralph, if I could ask you to go to page 66 of the final report and paragraph 8.8.9, and could that be amplified? That paragraph reads thus, flat nine on the third floor of Grenfell Tower was also damaged by fire. Flat nine can be ruled out as the area of origin of the first fire in Grenfell Tower because the occupant of flat nine spoke to the fire service at 0136.23, which was after the initial contact by Mr. Bahalu Kabedi. The f occupier of flat nine was reported stating that, quotes, the fire was not in her flat, but there was a lot of smoke, close quotes. Am I right in thinking that's the particular extract of evidence you've relied upon? Yes, and th this was important because when the fire investigators at a later point examined some of the other flats, on the floors beneath uh, floor, floor four, um, flat nine was quite extensively damaged. Uh, and the, it was then therefore important to be able to rule out flat nine because it was lower um, as a potential point of origin of the fire within the tower. Thank you. Um, and this uh, ruled that out as far as I was concerned quite conclusively because <coughs> the occupant um, was in flat nine after the fire had begun in, in flat 16. Have you seen any evidence since you completed your report on the 1st of November 2018 which uh, causes you materially to alter your conclusion in respect of hypothesis one or gives rise to an alternative hypothesis? No. no. Now, turning to your conclusion and the strength of your confidence in relation to your conclusion on hypothesis one, uh, put simply, would you say it was certain, probable or likely that the initial fire started in the kitchen of flat 16? In my view, it was certain. Thank you. Professor, we're now going to turn to hypothesis two, and that's the location within uh, <coughs> the kitchen uh, where you considered the, uh, the, the initial fire started. Ralph, could I ask you to turn to page 68 of the final report and paragraph 
Uh, Professor, you set out there, and I quote, the evidence of the firefighters and the images from the thermal <coughs> camera indicate that it is more likely than not that the area of origin of the fire was in the southeast area of the kitchen in flat 16. This is illustrated in figure 56 and photographically in figure 57. Um, first of all, does that remain your view? Yes. Thank you. Now, um, if I could ask Ralph to turn to page 69 and figure 56, first of all. Now, we've looked at this earlier, but do you confirm uh, that is the layout of the kitchen and at the southeast uh, end, yes. shaded red, is the area of origin? Yes. Thank you. And if we could turn... Uh, could I just clarify that? Sorry. I think that the shaded red area, I would, I would say, contains the area of origin. Thank you. Now, before I go to the uh, next photo, I should give a warning that people may find it's distressing. <coughs> it shows uh, the scene of the kitchen uh, after the fire. But, Ralph, could I ask you to turn to figure 57 at page 69? Now, this is a, a, a photograph of the kitchen and the area that contains the area of origin is again shaded red, is that right? That's correct, yes. And just so that people can uh, understand uh, the location of matters, starting at the far left hand side we have the kitchen window. Yes. Then in the foreground we have the old freezer. Yes. And next and below it the small fridge. Correct. Behind it we have the tall fridge freezer. Yes. And as we move rightwards, we have the cooker. Yes. A bin. Yeah. A possible toaster. Yes. A washing machine. Yes. The sink. Yes. And in the corner next to the sink, immediately next to it, we have the possible kettle. <coughs> and against the far right hand wall, the microwave. That's correct. Thank yes. you. Now, if that could be put down. As with hypothesis one, can I now turn to the evidence you've relied upon? for reaching your conclusion in respect of hypothesis two. Now again, the first source of evidence relied upon appears to be the evidence of Mr. Kabedi. Is that a, a, a fair summary? Yes, that would be fair. And Ralph, if I could ask you to turn to page 65 of the final report and paragraph 8.8.5. And I'll read this out. Uh, you say out there, and I quote, Mr. Bahalu Kabedi, who occupied flat 16 at Grenfell Tower, reports that he was wakened by the smoke alarm in his kitchen. He went into the kitchen via the main door, this was the door from the hallway, and stated that, and I quote, I could see light coloured smoke in the area next to the fridge freezer and window. It was in the general area there. The smoke was rising up from floor level and coming towards me. And, I quote, I saw smoke, it seemed to be coming from behind my hot point fridge freezer. The smoke was approximately two thirds of the height of the fridge freezer and had reached about where the cooker was, close quotes. He also described the smoke as, and I quote, dark, light dark, or light, in the record of interview data of the 14th of June 2017. And, I quote, the smoke that I saw in my kitchen was light and white in colour. I'm aware that in my first and second police interviews, I described the smoke as both light and dark. It is important to remember that I had just had the most frightening experience of my life and was in shock. I also did not have an interpreter during these two interviews, and I clearly needed one. When I said dark, I did not mean dark in colour, I meant thick. And finally, and I quote, the smoke by the window and the fridge side and underneath, close quotes. Is that the, per the pertinent extracts of evidence that you relied upon in relation to your yes, conclusions? Yes, that's, that's correct, From Mr. Yes. Kabeli, thank you. Now, again, the second source of evidence relied upon was the evidence of the first responders. Again, is that a fair summary, Professor? Yes, it is. Um, could I ask Ralph to uh, de-amplify that <coughs> turn to page 66, so it's the same page, and paragraph 8.8.12. And here you set out uh, the relevant extracts. First of all, you summarise the evidence of crew manager Batterby and firefighter Brown, and then you go on, go on to quote firefighter Brown. Now, before I deal with the quote, I think his Christian name is David as opposed to Daniel. Oh, I beg your pardon, yes. yes. And you set out there, and I quote, I explained to crew manager Batterby that we need to get right in and put it out. I opened the door, crew manager Batterby pulsed the ceiling once more, and then we moved in, turning left and extinguished the fire. 
The room began to clear to a point where I could make out. It was a kitchen. None of the worktops, or indeed any of the remainder of the room, was involved in the fire at that time. It was contained to one end, being to the left as you enter the room and from about two to three feet up. Crew manager Batterby pointed out that it was a fridge that he put out. This was towards the right-hand side of the back wall, sitting on something about two to three feet up. Again, this I, this I found a bit strange. Whilst I explained on one hand, I could only see flame from two to three feet up in. And Ralph, we go on to the next bit of the quote. In the air, it was in the wrong location, the force will cut in the flame I saw, which was more to the left of that wall. I walked towards the fridge to inspect it. It appeared around the top 25% of the fridge was heavily damaged. Immediately, I noticed little pieces of hot embers, debris falling outside. What I could now see was a window that had completely given way, leaving a hole in the wall. Below this window was a box sturdy enough to hold my weight and was not involved in the fire. And just for the sake of completeness, Ralph, you de-amplified that and amplify paragraph 8.8.13, so as to provide context. And this is just for the sake of completeness, I'll read this out. Uh, the box below the window is most like the old fridge referred to by Mr. Bahalu Kabedi. Quote, smaller fridge was stored on top of an old freezer in the corner opposite by the window, close quotes, and, open quotes, the broken freezer was just a few inches from the kitchen window, close quotes. And crew manager Charles Bashby and firefighter Daniel Brown also both said in their evidence the Grenfell Tower Public Inquiry that, and I quote, just in front of the window, there was something like a kitchen counter or board across there, which he climbed up onto, which obviously you cannot see now, but it was there. It seemed to be a worktop, a standard kitchen worktop, which was essentially in front of the window, close quotes, and quotes, firefighter Daniel Brown, it would be that smaller fridge in the foreground in the middle, that was against the wall right below the window. And if I could finally ask Ralph to turn to page 35 and paragraph 8.5.19. And again, I won't go through this, but that is the evidence from firefighter O'Hanlon that you relied <coughs> upon for identifying the location of the area of origin within flat 16, the kitchen of flat 16. Uh, yes, that's correct, yes. Thank you. Um, the third source of evidence, again, I think, is the thermal imaging camera footage. Is that right? Yes. And if I could ask Ralph to de-amplify that and turn to page 50, uh, 32, rather, and figure 19. And again, just for the avoidance of doubt, those are the images you relied upon for identifying the area within the kitchen that you consider um, contains the area of origin. The, these were, but I also used the thermal imaging um, video that was taken after the firefighters had begun to put the, the, the fridge out. Um, and that was because it provided very valuable information uh, relating to the um, damage to the appliances to the right of where I believe the area of origin to be. Thank you. And tying in with that answer, it appears that the fourth piece of evidence you've relied upon is the fire patterns on the wall in the kitchen. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And if I could ask Ralph to take that image down and turn to... Uh, page uh, 69 and figure 57, which we've looked at earlier. Now, Professor, if you could help us again, it may well be you need to retread the ground you trod in giving evidence in June and explaining <coughs> burn patterns and what you can learn from them. Um, I, w I wonder, actually, if, if it would be more helpful to um, take this uh, photograph was shown earlier in my report without the red line in it, and it might be easier to, to look at that one. Um, um, I don't have the reference immediately to hand for that photograph. I think it's earlier on in the report. I can do it from this one, it's okay. If just... we go to page 24. <laughs> I can do it from this one, it's, it's fine. Sorry, page 26, figure 14. Sorry, it's, I'm a new Perfect, word. yes. Thank you. <coughs> Ralph, page 66, 26 rather, sorry. Figure 14. Professor, if you could, probably easy if, if I could ask you to uh, sure. identify hmm. what burn patterns you've relied upon for the purposes of your conclusion in respect of hypothesis two. Okay, so I'll, I'll stand also. Um, what, what you're looking, looking at in terms of 
um, interpreting this photograph with regards to trying to narrow down an area, a potential area of origin, is not simply one of those factors individually, it's the combination of them all together. Those factors being the witness statements, particularly the TIC video, um, and also then the patterns on the, um, on the, the walls and on the appliances that, that we see in the photograph. The thermal imaging camera video in particular was hugely helpful to be able to say that the fire um, in the early stages damaged or was centered in only the area from uh, down at the fridge freezer and not the appliances on the other side of the fridge freezer. And that's the video we showed it back in that, June. That's correct. Yes. Um, the reason that I say that is because after the initial fire was extinguished, the fire at some point re-entered this flat and uh, at some point the appliances down this end from the cooker further down were damaged to a greater extent as a consequence of that re-entry. So the burn patterns that we're looking at and the damage to these appliances or as a result of the initial fire, plus a re-entry of that initial fire into the flat at a later point. So being able to sequence when this damage occurred and uh, what level of damage occurred to those appliances from the cooker towards the door, um, taken from the thermal imaging cameras, is incredibly important <coughs> because it showed, the TIC showed, that in actual fact there was very little, if any, damage to the appliances mm -hmm. from the cooker back to um, where the microwave is. And for, so we're looking at, in, in, so we, you were able to exclude, apologies if I put this too crudely, correct me mm -hmm. if I have done. On the basis of that, you felt able to con exclude the washing machine, the possible kettle and the microwave. Yes, absolutely, because the thermal imaging camera shows no damage, particularly to those appliances at all. Um, perhaps a bit of smoke damage, but nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. And that allows us very early on, because we know, uh, because of the firefighter's <coughs> intervention very early on, that um, the, where the fire was occurring was from the cooker forwards towards the window and we could rule out all of the other appliances that were in the rest of the kitchen. Thank you. I interrupted you, Professor. Apologies. I think you're about to explain for us what you deduced from the burn patterns in the south end of yeah. this kitchen. So in, in this particular um, photograph, this is one of the early photographs taken by the first fire investigation team that went in, which were from London Fire Brigade. And uh, their first task was to, um, quite rightly, take a series of photographs that would simply document the scene. So without moving things around too much or, or, or damaging things too much. And that's exactly the right approach to take. Uh, so this is one of those early photographs. It's taken from the living room, where the sliding doors were, looking into the kitchen. Um, and what we're seeing, so I'm standing probably close to where um, some of the, the television appliance and things like that were in the living room, looking into the kitchen. Um, what you're seeing from the left-hand side, which is the kitchen window side, over to the right-hand side, which is where the doorway uh, to the kitchen would be, which is behind this, uh, this, this pillar, um, or further on from behind that pillar, is a gradation, in my view, of the damage. So it looks to be more damaged. By the damage, I mean it looks blacker, it looks more charred. Um, to the kitchen side, then to the um, right hand side of, sorry, to the window side, then to the right hand side of the kitchen. Um, so that's one uh, aspect to, to view. Uh, we can also see from this photograph that the appliances towards the kitchen end, so that's the old freezer, the small fridge, and the tall fridge freezer are more, are damaged to a greater degree than the appliances um, starting with the cooker and moving back towards the um, door end of the kitchen. Um, the other thing of note is that the, this room has not gone, to, gone through a process that we call flashover. Flashover is indicated in terms of fire patterns or burn patterns by burning from essentially the ceiling right the way down to the floor. So everything that's combustible in the, in the particular compartment will burn. We've got um, items that have survived, for example, the bin, items on the floor, some of the uh, kitchen cabinets and the, the, the doors of those cabinets are only burned at the surface rather than um, uh, uh, burnt to a more penetrating degree. Um, so those patterns initially um, are, are helpful in uh, providing us with physical evidence to suggest that this end, the, kit, the window end of the kitchen, was the one that is more badly damaged. Thank you. Now, um, the fifth, and Ralph, you can put that image down now, um, it <coughs> seems that the fifth and final 
source of evidence you've relied upon are stills from Mr. Kabedi's phone. And if I could, or can photos taken by, with Mr. Kabedi's phone to be strictly accurate, um, could I ask you to turn to page 38 of the report in figure 23? Uh, first of all, could you explain for us what these images are, where they were taken from, and what do you think they show? Yes, um, so these uh, were images recovered from um, video that was uh, on, taken on Mr. Kabidi's uh, mobile telephone. The timestamp on the images was just after five, uh, five minutes past one in the morning. Um, and what the photographs show is from outside of Grenfell Tower, looking up towards the window of flat 16. So in photograph A, the um, red uh, glow up at the top is the, the, the window of the kitchen of flat 16, and I understand the red glow to be the early stages of the developing fire within that flat. Um, the white arrow uh, is pointing at um, a line, which, which looks to be a sharp line, um, uh, within that image, um, and that may be um, part of the window frame itself, or it may be part of the appliance. In picture B, which was taken at about the, ta the, the time stamp is the same, so it gives you an idea of how quickly uh, things were developing, um, the arrow, the white arrow in picture B is pointing at an area of flame that became uh, visible in the video to the other side of the kitchen window. So that's the side away from or opposite the, opposite. the, the position of the fridge freezer. Okay, thank you. Now, before... Uh, we come to look at your conclusions on hypothesis two. Um, could we turn to examine the, the electrical appliances that you've eliminated as having played any causative <coughs> role in more detail? Now, you've adverted the extent to which you've relied upon the video footage and excluding appliances from the cooker up to the microwave. But if we could yes. go through the evidence in more detail in relation <coughs> to those appliances. Now, again, could I just give a, a warning that some of these scenes show burnt out debris? The first appliance I'd uh, be grateful for your help in relation to is the cooker. And Ralph, if I could ask you to turn to page 60 and figure 54. Uh, yes. Now, that shows the cooker. I think I can lead on that. Um, and you say, if we turn back to page 59, Ralph, apologies, and paragraph 8.7.24, which is the bottom of page 59. Yes. You say the electric cooker to the right hand side of the tall fridge freezer was examined and found to have only superficial damage and melting to the plastic knobs of the appliance. Now, is it for that principal reason that you eliminated the cooker from consideration as having played any causative role? Um, it's for that reason, but also from the video footage of the TIC. Thank you. Uh, now, if we can go back to figure um, 57. Which is at page 69, Ralph. And if we could amplify figure 57. Looking in the far right hand side, the microwave. Um, the evidential basis for ruling out the microwave, would that be the video footage as well? Um, yes, pretty much for all of these appliances. So, so when you look at the photograph, they look to be badly damaged in some cases because they are, some of them are collapsed, some of them are melted, some of them are scorched, particularly the washing machine. However, um, as I've said, the uh, fire re-entered into the kitchen at some point um, during the, the, the incident. Um, the video footage from the thermal imaging camera, which was taken at the, the very first intervention of the firefighters into the kitchen, clearly showed that these appliances were not involved in the early stages of the fire. Thank you. And just following on from that answer, Ralph, if I could ask you to put down figure 57 and take us to page 81 of the report and paragraph 8.8.39, and this is in relation to the microwave professor, you say, quotes, Mr. Dan Matthews, if I add in parentheses, he's one of the investigators, I think. 
Uh, yes, he was one of the investigators for key forensic services. Thank you. Uh, also reports the internal fuse within the microwave had operated and determined that this was most likely as a result of external fire attack and not electrical activity. This was also the view expressed in the Bureau of Veritas Fire and Safety Department report dated 7th November 2017. Is that a view with which you agree? Yes. Uh, could you give us a reason as to why? Um, fuses within uh, appliances uh, in particular can operate, that means that they open or they, they, they blow, as, as, uh, as some experts have, have described it. Um, uh, they can operate as a result of uh, just simply heat, um, be, or experiencing heat from an external fire, as opposed to um, operating in their normal electrical safety function. Thank you. Um, could I ask Ralph to put that down and return us to page 69 and figure 57? And uh, we see there, at the right-hand side and in the middle, identification of kettle and toaster, respectively. Uh, can you help us on what basis did you eliminate these two appliances as having any causative role? Uh, again, a similar basis. They were clearly in view um, uh, in the TIC um, footage. Uh, they were also eliminated by Bureau Veritas in their examination. Thank you. Um, finally, you were in the hearing room yesterday to hear Dr. Glover's evidence. You've clearly read uh, the report yes. um, he provided. Are you content or agree with the, his conclusions in relation to the absence of causative uh, evidence, if I can put it that way, in relation to the appliances we've just discussed? Yes, I am. Thank you. Now, your conclusion, um, and if I could ask uh, Ralph to take us to page 68 and paragraph 8.8.16. <coughs> Your conclusion in respect of hypothesis two is this, and I quote, the evidence of the firefighters and the images from the thermal camera indicate that it's more likely than not that the area of origin of the fire was in the southeast area of the kitchen in flat 16. Now, um, accepting that you've sought to reach your conclusions on the balance of probabilities, um, first of all, have you seen any evidence that suggests an alternative to hypothesis two? No, I have not. Um, can we take it that you are reasonably confident uh, in your conclusion set out at 8.8.16? Yes, I'm confident of it. <coughs> Professor, could I now turn to hypothesis three? And Ralph, if I could ask you to take us to page 88 and paragraph 8.8.54. Uh, Professor, in relation to hypothesis three, i.e. that the area of origin was the tall freezer, you say this, and I quote, the combination of witness statements, TIC footage, that's the thermal imaging camera, the fire patterns on the tall fridge freezer, and the laminate flooring underneath the tall fridge freezer, and the conclusions reached by Don Dr. Duncan Glover in relation to his electrical examination, all indicate that it's more likely than not that the area of origin of the fire was located at the southeast corner of the kitchen in the tall fridge freezer located along the south-facing wall. Uh, first of all, does that remain your view? Um, yes, it does. Thank you. Now, again, as with the previous hy two hypotheses, I'd like to go through the evidence you've relied upon in uh, reaching uh, your conclusion. And again, if I could just repeat the general warning that we'll be looking at photographs that show uh, burned debris in the kitchen. Now, the first piece of evidence I'd like to turn to relates to the old freezer and the small fridge that was, I put it crudely, opposite the tall fridge freezer. Yes. Now, could I ask Ralph to take us first of all to page 71 and figure 58? And we see there in figure 58, in the middle of that page, in the bottom left-hand corner, <coughs> Uh, what you described as the assumed position of old freezer and small fridge. Is that right? Yes. Uh, could you help us? What is the evidential basis for you locating the old fridge freezer, uh, sorry, the old freezer and the small fridge there? Um, the positioning of them is based on the um, general plan that Mr. Kabidi and other witnesses that lived in the property uh, presented of where the items in the kitchen were and also in the witness statements that were presented by um, the initial firefighters who said that they stood on or, or lent on um, appliances that were, or, or materials that were there, which they later identified as the 
uh, two appliances we're talking about, and also then the final, uh, or finally, the photographs that were taken by the first um, fire investigators when they documented the scene, uh, when they <coughs> did their scene examination on the 14th of June. Thank you, Professor. Ralph, if you could put that down, and could we go back to figure 57 at page 69? <coughs> Sorry, my apologies. Could we go to page 72 first and figure 59? Thank you. Now, can you help us? What does this photograph show, first of all? So this photograph, I'll stand up and just talk you through it. Mm, that'd be useful, thank you. Um, this photograph is a photograph taken of the old freezer. So if you imagine looking at this, uh, or slightly to the, to the left of this aspect here, you would expect to see the window or the remains of the opening where the window was in the kitchen. This um, wooden uh, um, beam here, or, or, or piece of wood here, is I believe part of the partition, or the sliding door partition. And That's this between the to, kitchen and the living room. Between the kitchen and the Apologies living room. So I'm standing in the, in the living room uh, in my position right now. Um, and the appliance that you're looking at is the old freezer that was positioned under the kitchen window to the um, left-hand side as you look down the kitchen. In red, circled in red, is, uh, if you look at it carefully, is the remains of the appliance plug for this particular appliance. So and that the, red circle is in the lower half of this photograph. That's correct. And the, the, what is presumably the appliance cord um, is uh, uh, trailing down to that plug. Thank you. Uh, what do you deduce from the state of the plug? Um, it's, it's difficult to say just simply from the photograph, but taking um, the, the evidence in the photograph, so looking at it, uh, and also the evidence presented by Bureau Veritas in their report. Uh, the plug is not plugged in, obviously, um, but it also appears to be um, quite badly damaged by the effect of heat and possibly flame, um, and that it, it, it shows that that appliance was not plugged in at the time of the fire. Uh, what can we derive from the uh, burn marks on the side of the old freezer that's immediately in front of the photograph? Um, it's difficult really to, to provide a, a, a strong interpretation of that other than um, the fridge freezer has clearly been uh, severely affected by fire. And uh, do you agree with the conclusions that Dr Glover reached in relation to uh, the uh, old freezer unit? Yes. Thank you. Now, in relation to the small <coughs> fridge, uh, could I ask uh, Ralph to take us to figure 60, <coughs> which is at page 73, Again, uh, Professor, starting with a basic question first, what does this show us? Uh, so, again, it might be useful just to go back to the previous photographs just for a moment. That would be just to uh, orientate page 72. Yourself. Yes, apologies. Page 72, please, Ralph. And if you could amplify figure 59. Super. Thanks, Ralph. So this is, um, as we said, the old uh, freezer here. If you look to the right-hand side of the photograph, you just see the outline here of the small fridge. So it just puts the two appliances in context with and each other. What, what you're identifying there, just for the transcript, is in the far right-hand middle of the photograph what looks like a heavily rusty sheet of metal at an angle. That's correct. Mm. Professor, thank you. That was useful. If we can. Ralph, if we go now to page 73 and figure 60. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, Professor, what does this show us? So this is a um, photograph taken at a slightly different angle. So the previous photograph, and I'm pointing to the top left-hand corner of the photograph, was taken from that angle, where in the top left, this object that looks uh, slightly rusted is the old freezer. Um, and this now is, is looking at it from the opposite side, if you like. And the um, appliance that we're looking at in the middle, this box-shaped thing, is the small fridge. Um, it's up against uh, the, uh, what is a door on the right-hand side, and that's the bottom door of the fridge freezer, the tall fridge freezer. And right to the, to the very right of the photograph, you see the bottom of the cooker. So this uh, appliance here is the cooker. Thank you. Uh, what's your assessment of 
uh, whether the small fridge was plugged in or not on the night of the fire? Um, my understanding is that it was not, but I, I am only... There, there's no um, uh, photographic evidence um, that I can see, as there was with the old freezer. Um, of plugs or any other sort of uh, parts of the appliance um, that are visible in these photographs. Uh, but the witness statements and those of the fire investigators uh, who did see the appliance in situ have said that it was not plugged in. Thank you. And just for the sake of completeness, if I could ask you, um, first of all, to confirm, are you content with Dr. Glover's conclusions in relation to the small fridge? Yes, I yes, am. Thank you. Um, could I ask you now to turn to page 74 on paragraph 8.8.25. Sorry, eight, if we can just start for 8.824. Um, professor, take you to 8.8.24. So it just fleshes out the answer I think you've just given as to another aspect of evidence to whether the small fridge was plugged in or not. Yes, that, that's correct. This is taken from um, uh, a discussion or an interview between um, watch manager Lever and Mr. Kabidi. And uh, just for the record, 8.8.24 .8 reads thus, quotes, the witness statements of Mr. Bahalu Kabidi and cont contemporaneous notes of firefighter Daniel Brown also suggested that the initial fire was not in the old freezer and small fridge. Mr. Bahalu Kabidi, when being interviewed by watch manager Matthew Lever, said, quotes, Lever, and these two, referring to the old freezer and small fridge, definitely not plugged in. Kabedi, definitely these not working. Firefighter Daniel Brown said that, and I quote, crew manager Batterby pointed out it was the fridge that he put out. This was towards the right-hand side of the back wall, close quotes. That's the evidence you relied upon in your conclusions. Yes. Um, could I now ask you to turn to paragraph 8.8.25, same page? And just to confirm for the avoidance of doubt. Right, thank you. Uh, you conclude here in relation to the old freezer and small fridge, quotes, on the basis of this evidence, it's unlikely that the old freezer and small fridge are in the area of origin of the fire, although these appliances were clearly involved in the fire at some later point. This allows the area of origin of the fire to be narrowed to the southeast corner of the kitchen as indicated by the red line in figure 62. And if we could de-amplify that paragraph and amplify figure 62, which is immediately below. The red line to which you refer is that marked in the far left-hand side. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, final question in this respect. Do you remain of the view set out in paragraph 8.8.25 in relation to the old freezer and small fridge? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, so that is a convenient point at which to invite yes, you to rise right. for a small break. Yes, well, Professor, we normally have a short break about an hour into the session. So we'll take one now. We'll resume at 10 past 11. Thank you. I have to ask you please not to talk about your evidence to anyone when you're out of the room. Of course. And uh, if you go with the usher, she'll look after you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right, 10 past 11 then, please.
Right, Professor, I'm ready to carry on. Yes, thank you. Good, thank you. Yes, Mr. Kinnear. Thanks, sir. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for coming back. We were dealing with hypothesis three, and yes. we were dealing with electrical appliances <coughs> that are found within uh, the narrowed down area of origin. Yes. Uh, that you set out in your report. Now, the second appliance I'd like to um, discuss with you is the hot plate electric cooking device that's been variously described as an MTAD or an injera pan. Yes. Now, if I could ask Ralph to put up figure 63 on page 75. And if you could amplify figure 63. First of all, is that the appliance that has been variously described as I've just set out? Yes, that's my understanding. Thank you very much. Uh, are you uh, content that, irrespective of uh, where this pan may have been stored before the fire, there is no evidence, first of all, to suggest that it was plugged in that on the is night correct, of the fire? Yes. yes. And are you content with Dr. Glover's assessment that, were, that the item showed no signs of electrical activity? Yes. Or arcing, to be pertinent? Yes. Therefore, can this device be ruled out as having played any causative role in the initial fire? In my opinion, yes. Thank you. The third appliance or device I'd like to cover is the kitchen extractor fan. And Ralph, may I ask you to turn to page 28 of figure 15? First of all, Professor, what does this photo show? Um, this was a photograph that was taken uh, of uh, flat 13 which was used, uh, as I understand it, as an exemplar flat to look at the orientation of various parts of the kitchen, uh, particularly the, uh, the, the area around the window. Um, so it's my understanding that this um, photograph was, was, was used and has been used as an exemplar to show what the kitchen window setup, if you like, was like in flat 16. Um, so you have the large uh, window pane or large window uh, to the left-hand side of the photograph, the small window pane to the right-hand side, and above that, there was an infill panel which housed the extractor fan. Thank you. And if we could uh, de-amplify that, please, Ralph, and just for the sake of completeness, go to paragraph 8.4.5, which is at page 27. And this is just to confirm the evidence you've given that effectively the photograph shows a, a comparable flat. Yes. Thank you. Now, uh, Ralph, if you could take that down, and could you take us to page 80, and in particular, paragraph 8.8.35. Now, here you are discussing the various examinations that were carried out uh, in relation to the gridded areas within the kitchen, which we've covered before in June. And you say at 8.8.35, you say this. The, these examinations appear to involve removal of the various items from the bags in which they were contained, followed by a non-destructive visual examination. In some cases, a microscope, unspecified in terms of type, was also used, and in some cases, X-ray examination of fuses was undertaken. Yes. Now, for the, uh, the uninitiated in the room, what can you derive from non-destructive visual examination? Um, generally, and then we'll look at the extractor fan debris. Okay. Um, Non-destructive visual examination is exactly as it sounds. So it is, it involves looking at the various components, so they might be small conductors, they might be the larger appliance, um, by eye initially. Uh, they might involve some cleaning of the items so that they can be visualised or, or looked at in more detail and they might involve looking at some of the components under a microscope or with um, specialist equipment such as x-rays, micro CT scanners, um, scanning electron microscopes and so on. All of that is non-destructive in terms of the examination of this particular item. Thank you. And uh, just to uh, bottom off this point, do you agree with the analysis that Dr. Glover set out in relation to the extractor fan and that it effectively played no causative role in the initial fire? Um, yes, I do. Thank you. Now, just to um, flesh out uh, the evidence in relation to the extractor fan, could I ask Ralph to take us to page 38 and figure 23? Now, we looked at this earlier, but I think it may be helpful just to go back looking at the particular context of the kitchen extractor fan, looking at screenshot A on the left-hand side, first of all, what does the white arrow specifically indicate? Um, what I was indicating with this white arrow was the black line 
Uh, so the line of flame looks to be running up against a black line. Now this may very well be um, part of the construction of the window, um, or it may be um, something that relates to the positioning of the flame within the kitchen, so against the appliance, the tall fridge freezer, for example. Um, it very much depends on the angle at which the photograph was taken, but that's what the white line is indicating. Okay, and looking at little b, you've explained to us on what the arrow on the far right-hand side indicates. Can, what, if anything, can you deduce from the uh, orange colour in the middle of the photograph in relation to the kitchen extractor fan? Nothing really Nothing. from this photograph. Could I ask you to take that down, Ralph, and turn to page, and go back rather, to page 39, and looking at figure 25. Again, I acknowledge we've gone through these uh, earlier, but I want to look at it in the particular context um, of the kitchen extractor fan. Um, starting on the far left-hand side, does little a teach us anything or can, it, or can we deduce anything, rather, about the causative role of the kitchen extractor fan simply from this photo? Um, I, not in terms of a causative role. What the photograph shows um, in, in a sequence is the flames starting or appearing to uh, begin to burn around the extractor fan and where the infill panel was. It might be useful to look at the photographs in figure 24 as well. Yes, please. Um, just to put all of them together yep. uh, on the one screen, so 24 and 25. So if I... Sorry, you're on your feet quite a lot during the course of this okay. place. Um, so if I'm looking at the very first uh, photograph of um, figure 24, so the one to the, to the far left, um, you can begin to see, and looking at these in sequence, simply following one from the other, um, both in 24 and then in 25, you can begin to see the flames developing around in a circular pattern um, around where this infill was. And those I believe to be the flames burning around where the, the metal extractor fan would be. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, we can put those down now. <coughs> now, the next matter in relation to materials within what you've identified as the uh, hypothetical area of origin is the presence of any other combustible materials in the southeast end of the kitchen. Now, we don't need to go to it, but in your preliminary report, you noted that there may have been the presence of combustible material uh, in the south end of the kitchen. Now, on the basis of the available evidence, is there anything to suggest the presence of any other combustible materials that may have ignited a fire in the southeast end of the kitchen? Uh, not that may have ignited a fire. There was evidence presented by um, the, uh, the witnesses um, who uh, lived in the flat to say that there was a mop and a bucket that was usually stored in that area. And they may have contributed, because they may have been combustible, so they may have contributed to the fire. Thank you. Now, uh, is the position we've reached, therefore, that with the exception of the tall fridge freezer, all other alternative appliances have been excluded as having any causative role in the area of origin you've identified in the report? Yes. Thank you. Now, can we turn to the tall fridge freezer now? And could I ask you to turn to page 88 in your report and paragraph 8.854? There you say, and I quote, the combination of witness statements, TIC footage, the fire patterns on the tall fridge freezer, and the laminate flooring underneath the tall fridge freezer, and the conclusions reached by Dr. Duncan Glover in relation to his electrical examination, all indicate that it's more likely than not that the area of origin of the fire was located at the southeast corner of the kitchen in the tall fridge freezer located along the south facing wall. Does that remain your view? Yes, it does. Now, again, as with the previous hypotheses, if I may take us through the various sources of evidence you've relied upon in reaching your view. Now, the first one uh, source of evidence you've relied upon would be the evidence of Mr. Kabedi. Is that right? Yes. And if I could ask Ralph to take us to, par uh, to page 72, rather, and paragraph 8.8.23. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that the evidence you've relied upon for uh, ex or concluding that it was only the large fridge freezer, the tall fridge freezer, that was plugged in and turned on? 
Uh, yes, that's correct. And that if I could ask uh, Ralph to deamplify that paragraph and to amplify 8.8.24 on the same page. And just for the sake of completeness, we've looked at this before in the context of the old freeze and the small fridge, but equally that evidence as well. Yes. Thank you. And Ralph, you could deamplify that and amplify paragraph 8.8.24 on page 74. Apologies, and it's really to draw out, um, in particular, Firefighter Brown's evidence at the bottom of that paragraph. You relied upon that as well? Yes. Thank you. And there you've taken to mean the fridge that he put out being the fridge, the tall fridge freezer? Correct, yes. Is there any further ele uh, evidence that you've seen which would be relevant to this aspect of your consideration of the evidence as to whether the tall fridge freezer was plugged in and turned on? By this, you mean the, the witness Fact, Factual witness statement. Uh, no, this, is, this covers it. Thank you. Now, the next source of evidence, uh, I think, again, is the thermal images. And if we could turn to page 32 of your report and figure 19 again. Now, in the particular context <coughs> of the tall fridge freezer, to what extent have you relied upon <laughs> this imaging? in identifying the tall fridge freezer as the area of origin, if at all? Um, this, this was more difficult, um, really because the thermal imaging camera is showing areas within the kitchen uh, towards the window end where there was um, a greater intensity of heat. Um, so in my interpretation of these images, uh, it points out that these areas of greater heat were around the tall fridge freezer as opposed to being within the tall fridge freezer. Uh, now, can I ask Ralph to take us to page 37 of the report and figure 22? Now, first of all, what does this show? Um, this is a still from the thermal imaging camera uh, just after the firefighters have extinguished the fire, the majority of the fire, in the tall fridge freezer. Uh, what it depicts, I'll stand up again. Um, what, it, what it depicts is, if we look from the right-hand side across to the left-hand side, is the part of the cooker. You can just see the cooker knobs um, uh, just around here. And then um, the faint ones in the bottom right-hand corner. Yes, that, yeah. that's correct. Um, and then you can begin to see along here, which is about midway in the photograph, uh, um, uh, grey line that comes out from the back of the photograph towards the front. Yes. That's the open door of the bottom compartment of the tall fridge freezer. Um, the area where the little green um, box is centred is the bottom compartment of the tall fridge freezer. The area immediately above that where the blue cross is, is the top compartment of the tall fridge freezer. Over, as you move over towards the left of the, uh, of the photograph and along almost in uh, perpendicular to the open door of the bottom compartment is another grey um, defined area which I believe to be the door of the top of the tall fridge freezer. And then further on um, uh, where my arrow points at and says items between tall fridge freezer and the window which are now believed to be the mop and the bucket are highlighting some items that we can just about make out and then over further where the number 129C is, you can just see behind that um, a silhouette of the firefighter. When looking at uh, area of origin, to what extent does this thermal image assist you? Um, it's, it's, it provides assistance in that it shows some of the early damage to the appliance, which is the tall fridge freezer. Um, it shows that there wasn't damage to the cooker, um, and it shows that the, the damage to the tall fr fridge freezer was, was um, significant in that part of the door, sorry, the door of the top compartment had come away and the bottom door had opened. In relation to establishing cause, which we'll come on to later on, to what extent, if at all, does this image help? It doesn't help me at all. Thank you. Now, the next source of evidence I'd like <coughs> to uh, go through the, the corrosion, the burn patterns on the fridge freezer itself. And might I ask Ralph to take us to pages, page 76 to start off with. Thank you very much. 
and looking at figure 64 in particular. And if that could be amplified for these purposes. Thank you, Ralph. Again, Professor, first of all, what does this photo show us? Um, what this photograph is showing is, um, so we're, we're looking down into the corner where the tall fridge freezer was, or is, uh, along the um, left-hand side. This is the edge of the window. Um, you can see some <coughs> debris that's sitting on top of the window, fr uh, window sill. Um, as we move closer and over <laughs> towards the right-hand side, um, you can see a, a, a pattern on the wall, which is this sort of motley colour or discoloration on the wall, which indicates that there was flame impinging or, or up against that wall. And then as we move over to the item on the right-hand side, this is the tall fridge freezer, where you can see um, significant damage, uh, fire damage within the top compartment of the fridge freezer. Uh, Ralph, if you, if you could de-amplify that photograph. And you'll see at the bottom of uh, page 76, there's a second figure 64. And if we could amplify that. <coughs> Professor, again, if we can look at the photograph on the left-hand side, what do the burn corrosion patterns on the wall, what can you deduce from them? Um, the patterns, so we're looking at these patterns here, which are in between the um, fridge freezer and the, the, the side of the window, which is here on the left, you're looking at, at a number of things. The patterns on the wall are all the way down to the, to the ground, um, and these patterns are most likely caused by flame impinging, so flame up against uh, the wall from the top to the bottom. Um, you're also, uh, or potentially, um, from the top to the bottom. Um, what you also see is that the laminate flooring in between where the fridge freezer is and where the side of the uh, bottom underneath the window, wall underneath the window is, is clean. Um, so it's not damaged by uh, fire directly. Uh, and next to that you have the tall fridge freezer appliance. Thank you. Now looking at the right hand side photograph, um, you've got letters A and B marked on the side of the tall fridge freezer. Yes. But before we get to that, there appears to be a red bag. Can you help us, first of all, what that red bag is? Um, my understanding of what the red bag is, is that it is uh, a red plastic bag that was put on to a set of uh, cables or conductors that were behind the uh, tall fridge freezer, and that that bag was attached um, to those conductors by the fire investigators in order to try to uh, protect the conductors from damage would be my uh, understanding Thank of you. what they were doing. What does letter, capital letter A, denote? So capital letter A, perhaps we'll take both of them together if, if, if you don't mind, capital letter A and capital letter B both depict two different fire patterns. And what do you deduce from the fire patterns? So for fire pattern depicted by the letter A, uh, you can follow it by looking at the two photographs in comparison with each other. This shows a discoloration uh, on, the, on the side of the tall fridge freezer that runs from the bottom of the appliance right the way up to the top. Um, so it's spread out, and it's depicted by the red line that I've drawn. It's spread out and runs up the, uh, the whole length of the appliance. The pattern uh, B is another pattern that runs across the side of the appliance and across, in part, across the front door of it, which we'll see, I presume, a little bit later. <coughs> what pattern A su suggests to me is that the um, tall fridge freezer on this side, there's a, there's a, a mirroring pattern on the other side of the, of the uh, appliance, is that the appliance was affected by fire from the bottom to the top. What you're seeing is a delamination of the, of the um, or a burning off of the paint uh, from the... Um, the metal, and that's caused a discoloration, and that would have occurred because of direct flame attack on the appliance. Thank you, Professor. And just so if you stay on your feet, I apologise again. If we can look at that mirror image on the other side, can we turn to figure 65 on page 77? First of all, can you confirm this is the mirror image to which you were referring in your Yes, what, what you're looking at here is the fridge freezer has been moved away from the wall that it was up against, so it's been moved about um, some uh, distance away. Um, and we're looking now at, if I was standing looking at the fridge freezer in front of me, we're now mm. looking at the right-hand side of it. Um, now, 
Thank you, Professor. And if we look at the right-hand photograph, again, we have burn patterns indicated A and B. Is that right? Yes. What do you deduce, first of all, from the fire pattern A? Um, same as, as the previous one. It's, it's a continuation, if you like, of the other patterns. So they both would have occurred more or less at the same time on each side of the appliance. So it shows uh, a fire attack from the bottom to the top of that appliance. And again, B is the mirror image of B in figure 64. That's correct. Thank you. Um, could I now um, uh, ask you to turn to page 79? Apologies, before we go there, can I ask you to turn to page 78 and figure 66? Just whilst we're looking at burn patterns on the fridge itself. And Ralph, if you'd amplify figure 66 itself. Professor, apologies again. Summon you to your feet. Looking at the far left-hand corner, what can we deduce, if anything, or indeed the right-hand corner photo, what do we deduce, if anything, from the nature and extent of the fire patterns identified in the red line on so the right-hand what, side? What's happened here is that the fire investigators have repositioned the door of the top compartment of the fridge freezer back into what they perceive or believe to be its original position um, uh, or how it would have uh, been viewed. Mm -hmm. If you recall, this door fell off the appliance at some point and was found by the fire investigators lying on the floor um, uh, propped beside the bottom door which was open. Um, the pattern that you're looking at is depicted on uh, with the red line and again what you've seen or what we're seeing is a, a, de a bur burning off of the paint on the surface of the top door um, allowing the door to be uh, corroded. Um, the pattern uh, appears to move from the left hand side to the right, by that I mean it's further down on the left hand side than it is on the right hand side. Um, and that could be uh, simply just a, a consequence of the dynamic nature of the fire. Or it could also be a consequence of the movement of gases because there was a window, therefore a ventilation opening, to the left hand side of that appliance. Understood. And that would excuse Sorry. <coughs> Can I just ask, is the pattern we see on, in this photograph, on, on what is the <coughs> excuse me, front of the door, a continuation of pattern B on the side? Uh, in, in part. It's a continuation of the pattern, uh, and it's difficult to ascertain that because, no. of course, we can't see it in three dimensions. Um, but it appears to be a continuation of the, uh, of the patterns on, on both sides. So if you look yeah. at the photograph quite um, uh, carefully, um, where the red line, where the door is, is, is breached on the right-hand side, you can just about see the right-hand side mm. of mm. the fridge, freezer, and you can see that that corrosion line is almost yeah. in line across yeah. the door and the, and the right-hand side. Professor, thank you. Again, if I could ask you to stay on your feet. Sorry about this. If I could ask <coughs> Ralph to turn to page 79. And Ralph, if we're able to split screen figures 67 and 68 so they are alongside each other. If not, don't worry. Fantastic, thank you. Professor, if we can look at figure 67, first of all. Uh, what yes. Is your, what, first of all, what does it show? And then secondly, what's your interpretation? So this is, we're now looking at the laminate floor that was uh, in the area of the kitchen where the fridge freezer originally stood. So if I look at it from the right-hand side across <laughs> to the left, um, what the fire investigators have done is they have cleared away all of the appliances and they have cleared away uh, most of the debris from this area. So they've cleared away all of the surface um, uh, fire debris and bits of loose materials. What uh, they've observed as they've done that across this laminate floor is that there's an area which is highlighted by the red mark um, that illustrates an area where the laminate floor has been burnt through. And that's significant because the areas on either side of it have not been burnt through. This area corresponds with the positioning of the fridge freezer. Thank you. Um, the white lines, the white arrows, um, illustrate an area at the back almost matching exactly the positioning of this burn mark in the laminate um, that shows that the skirting board has also burnt down to a low point in comparison to the skirting board on both sides. Um, and that's also significant because it um, 
provides physical evidence that a fire burnt there to a greater extent than it did to the areas on either side of that burn mark. Thank you. And then, can, can we see the remains of the skirting board at all? Um, you can just about. If you look very carefully, it looks uh, a little bit more burnt towards the um, uh, right-hand side of the mark, as you can see in the, the, mm. the furthermost right arrow. And there is, uh, there is a, uh, some, <laughs> some remains, from what my interpretation of the photograph is, yeah. of parts of the, um, the skirting board. Would it assist, uh, Ralph, are you able to magnify figure 67 sufficiently so that Professor Nick Dade can identify the extent of the damage That's on the good. rock? That's yeah. brilliant, thank you. Yeah, so you can see uh, along here, and I'm pointing just at this kind of jaggedy, charred mm. edge, um, that, that shows some of the woods of the skirting board remaining. And Professor, again, simply for the assistance of the transcriber, if we're looking at the right-hand <laughs> end of the red mark which identifies the burnt laminate flooring. At the top of that is the skirting board, is that right? Yes. And as we look across the left-hand side, you've identified the far right-hand side as being the greatest extent of damage to the skirting board. Yes. Which diminishes as you go along towards the window. It doesn't diminish completely, it goes up and down. Up but and yes. down. Okay. Thank you. Ralph, if you could demagnify that, mm. but thank, thank you. you. Professor, just for the sake of completeness, and Ralph, if you could magnify figure 68, Again, just for the sake of completeness, Professor, could you just identify what this is for us? Yes, these are the uh, portions of the laminate flooring taken from immediately under the tall fridge freezer uh, and slightly to both sides that were recovered by the fire investigators from Flat 16. Okay. Now, tying together the evidence you've given in relation to the floor burn patterns and the burn patterns that you identified on the large fridge freezer itself, what is your conclusion, or are you able to give us a conclusion, as to where within the large fridge freezer the, the initial fire may have been, in your view? Um, looking at the, these burn patterns in particular, the burn pattern to the skirting board, and also the damage to the sides in particular of the, uh, of the outside of the tall fridge freezer, um, where that damage runs from the bottom to the top, uh, it would be my view that um, the fire uh, was originally orientated at the base of the fridge freezer. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, thank you very much. If you could put those photographs down. Um, Professor, could I ask you now to turn to page 83 of your report and paragraph 8.845. <coughs> Professor, here you say, and I quote, we're going now looking away from the large fridge freezer itself, but looking at the fuse box, or what was called the consumer unit yesterday. Yes. And uh, you identify here the operation of the MCB. First of all, when you refer to the MCB, it's in fact what we were calling yesterday the circuit breaker. Is that right? It, it's a, it stands for miniature circuit breaker, yes. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And just so it can be read into the record, you say here, and I quote, the operation of the MCB would have occurred before the main electrical supply to flat 16 was deactivated. If Mr. Behalu Kabedi's recollection is correct, then he operated the main switch in the fuse box as he exited flat 16. This is important because it means that if electrical activity as a result of fire attack or appliance failure was found within flat 16, then it would have occurred within the early stages of the developing fire when the kitchen circuit, circuit 7, and the appliances were still energised. This means that evidence of electrical activity such as arc melting could provide specific physical evidence linked to the earliest stages of the fire's development, which would assist in narrowing the area of fire origin as defined by the electrical system. Now, first things first, does that remain your view? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. And to the avoidance of doubt, is it your understanding that the tall, the large fridge freezer was served by circuit seven? That's my understanding, yes. Thank you very much. Now, Ralph, if you could de-amplify uh, that paragraph. <coughs> and if you could amplify figure 70, and first of all, A. And when you were referring to Mr. Kabeli's evidence in terms of switching off the main switch, there it is identified in the down position, indicating off. Yes. And if that could be de-amplified, Ralph, and if you could amplify B. And really, as discussing yesterday, next but one from the right hand side, circuit breaker is circuit seven, which is in the off. Yes, correct. Right. 
Uh, can I now ask you to turn to paragraph 8.849, and that's at page 85. And there you summarise uh, the conclusions in Dr. Glover's report. Uh, my question is, do you agree with the conclusions he reached in that report in respect uh, of arc damage? In, in relation to his identification of arc damage on MJS1 and JDG1, yes. Thank you. Uh, turning uh, further down to 8.850, you say this, and I quote, Dr. Duncan Glover reported that he observed evidence of alloying damage, that is, melting of copper in the presence of another metal, which acts to reduce the temperature at which copper metal mixture melts on exhibits MJS2 and JDG2, both of which were recovered from BPS3, which is the wiring recovered from the base of the tall fridge freezer. Electrical fire experts from exponents also observed evidence of electrical activity on wiring consistent with fire involvement while energised as either a cause or result of the fire. Does that remain your view? Yes, it does. Thank you. And if I could ask you finally to turn to 8.851, and if that could be amplified rather again. And I quote, a more specific examination of the electrical <coughs> items and the wires recovered from the southeast corner of the kitchen of flat 16 was undertaken by Dr. Duncan Glover, and the potential sequence of operation of the circuit breakers was discussed. As a result of his examinations, Dr. Duncan Glover stated that, quote, it's probable that the fire origin is at the electrical component that caused the circuit break of circuit number seven, the kitchen circuit, to trip, close quotes. Does that remain your view? Um, yes, it does. Now, in relation to you were, in, you were in, I was about to say you were in court, but you were in the hearing yesterday. Yes. Um, is there anything in relation to the um, ex examination of circuit number seven that you'd wish to add to what Dr. Glover said yesterday? Um, in terms of the examination of circuit seven, yep. I agree that the um, miniature circuit breaker uh, tripped out or operated as a result of uh, a short circuit that occurred in an appliance uh, that was attached to that circuit. Um, I'm not in full agreement with some of the other electrical evidence that Dr. Glover gave, but I'm not an electrical expert. Okay. Now, if we can just deal with the bits, uh, figure 71, first of all, at page 86. Now, can you first of all explain for us what this is? Um, this is a uh, the corner of uh, sorry a diagram of the corner of uh, the kitchen of flat 16. We've seen the diagram um, already, and what I have done on this particular diagram is annotate where the various uh, items that were examined by Dr. Glover, um, which were shown to have evidence of electrical activity in the report that and the, and the memo that I was provided with, um, and what I've attempted to do is. Uh, show in this figure where these particular items were recovered from uh, so that we can put some context and some um, electrical evidential boundaries around where the potential area um, of origin as defined by the electrical system would be. Thank you. And if you could de-amplify that, Ralph, and if we could next turn to paragraph 8.8.53. And this summarises your uh, tallying together, if I can put it like that, of the evidence. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And to quote, figure 72 illustrates the southeast corner of flat 16 on the 9th of October 2017. This photograph was taken after most of the context of flat 16 had been removed. The fire patterns within this photograph illustrate physical evidence that suggests the area of origin of the fire to be within the southeast part of the kitchen. These fire patterns include one burn pattern on the laminate floor correspond Thank you. Corresponding to the position of the tall fridge freezer. Two, position of melting on the socket and conduit on the wall next to the tall fridge freezer. The lowest area of burning of the skirting board in the southeast part of the kitchen corresponding to the position of the tall fridge freezer. That remains your view, I assume. Yes, it does. Thank you. Now, could I turn to the uh, second substantive topic that you dealt with in your report, and that was the cause of the fire, and that's dealt with at section 8.9. And in your provisional report, we don't need to go to it, um, you suggested that in-depth analysis of the electrical system 
um, of the electrical wiring was required. Now, an examination has been provided by Dr. Glover. Was that the examination uh, that you were looking for? Uh, in part, yes. I think that there's the examination up to this point has been non-destructive. Um, the, there is also the option uh, of undertaking destructive analysis that m may um, provide further uh, information in regards to the earlier um, uh, or the areas of electrical activity that might have occurred. Uh, how productive do you think destructive testing would be in providing more definitive evidence? Uh, that's very hard for me to say because I'm not an, I'm not an electrical expert. I'm aware of the fact that there is um, uh, other testing that could be carried out that might provide um, some st um, greater evidence or more evidence that, for example, electrical activity occurred um, or, or electrical activity as a result of the fire might have occurred in some of the conductors perhaps that Dr. Glover was talking about yesterday. Okay. Now, in relation to cause itself, could I ask you to turn to paragraph 8.9.5 of page 88? And that was the conclusion you set out uh, in the report in terms of cause, i.e. it was uh, undetermined. Now, Mindful again, reminding uh, myself that uh, you've set yourself the balance of probabilities. Sorry, this is, this is not that. This is about the area of origin, not about the cause. Sorry, 8.9.5. At the bottom of page 88. Sorry, thank you, Professor. That's okay. Um, Better ask the question again. I think I probably had. <laughs> uh, quote... Um, First of all, set out there is your conclusion in relation to cause. Yes. Now, um, reminding ourselves that you've, you've set yourself the balance of probabilities, um, having regard to the evidence that you've considered and having regard to the report that uh, Dr. Glover provided, which you reviewed within this report, are you able to conclude, at least on the balance of probabilities, that the origin of the fire was in the tall fridge freezer? Uh, in terms of the origin, yes. Yes. Now, in terms of cause of the fire, um, taking it step by step, What's your view as to whether the cause of the fire was electrical or non-electrical? I think gathering all of the evidence together, um, and in particular the physical evidence, which provides, uh, in my view, very strong evidence to suggest that the area of origin of the fire was in the base of the fridge freezer, and that evidence includes the burn patterns on the floor, the skirting board, um, and uh, some of the electrical evidence that from Dr. Glover, particularly relating to um, the alloying of the, of the conductors in that area. Uh, on the basis of that, um, it would be my view that the cause of the fire was electrical in origin, but the exact um, uh, nature of that cause, so what particular electrical components, remains uh, undetermined in my view. And I think you've emphasised in your report that uh, your expertise doesn't lie in forensic electrical examination. Correct. And would it flow from your answer that determining precise cause would uh, be best determined by a forensic electrical? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, apologies if I'm pressing you on the point, but looking at as to your answer that it's more likely than not that it was an electrical cause. Electrical in nature, yes. Electrical in nature. Um, how confident are you in relation to that conclusion? Um, I'm, I'm confident that that's, that's my conclusion. Thank you. The next topic I'd like to cover is um, the nature of the cause, and it's really whether it was an accident, deliberate, or whatever. Okay. And if I could ask you to turn to page 97... And paragraph 9.4, you say in the latter part of paragraph 9.4, quotes, it is more likely than not to be an accidental cause. Now, if I could look at the evidence that you've relied upon for coming to that conclusion. Um, first of all, am I right in thinking that the material gathered from the window end of Flat 16's kitchen was examined using the services of a hydrocarbon dog? Yes, this is, um, they're called hydrocarbon dogs or arson dogs. Um, and these are animals that are trained to detect the presence of particular chemicals that are in ignitable liquids. Yeah. 
and uh, as you said, really the dog is uh, looking for any liquid accelerants that might have played a role in the cause of the fire. Is that a... It's looking for the presence of, of um, liquid accelerant materials or liquid ignitable liquid, sorry, and, ignitable liquid materials. Sorry. And what was the result of the examination that was carried out using the services of the hydrocarbon dog? Um, the results of the dogs are used as a tool simply to try to uh, help the fire investigators in regards to the possible presence of an ignitable liquid. That doesn't necessarily mean the ignitable liquid wasn't there for a legitimate cause. Uh, in this particular case, the dog was... Um, deployed in the kitchen, as, as is my understanding, and the result of uh, that particular deployment was a negative result. Mm. By that I mean there was no ignitable liquid residue detected as determined by the dog. Okay. And to be more specific, um, is it right that the samples of the laminate floor were also analysed for the presence of ignitable fluid? Yes, they were examined by key forensic services. And again, am I right in thinking that that produced a negative result? Uh, their conclusion was there was no ignitable liquid present in those samples. Um, are you satisfied that the presence of an external accelerant, such as petrol or some other similar substance in the area of origin, can be discounted? Yes. Absolutely? Yes. Thank you. Is there any evidence you've seen which would indicate anything other than an accidental cause? No. Thank you. Penultimate topic I'd like to cover with you, Professor, and that's the spread of the fire within Flat 16. Yes. Now, your analysis is set out in section 8.10 of your report, and in particular, paragraph 8.10.10. And if I could ask Ralph to <coughs> amplify that. And that paragraph uh, says this, within the, and I quote, within the kitchen, there appears to be more fire damage at a level above the worktops, with the exception of one, damage to the external surfaces of cupboards closest to the hallway, two, the damage revealed to the laminate flooring under the tall fridge freeze in the southeast corner, three, a burn pattern that reaches the floor to the north side by the window, associated most likely with the combustion of the old freeze and smaller fridge that were reported to be present in this area by Mr. Behalu Kabedi. It is uncertain when these items became involved in the fire, other than it was after the initial fire in the kitchen. There was less fire damage in the adjacent living room than in the kitchen. The sliding doors between kitchen and living room had burned away, and the fire pattern generated by the combustion of the unplugged old freezer and smaller fridge can be seen penetrating into the living room near the opening left by the living room sliding doors. Now, stopping there, does that remain your view? Yes, your it does. Now, in terms of... Uh, spread within flat 16. First of all, did you listen to Professor Bisbee's evidence? Uh, yes, I did. Yes. Uh, in light of that and in light of your broader consideration of the evidence, is there any further assistance you can provide the inquiry in relation to the spread within the kitchen of flat 16? No, I don't believe so. Thank you. Now, the final um, topic I'd like to uh, your assistance on, really, the final question I asked Dr. Glover yesterday related to experience in the US of metal backings to fridges. Um, first of all, in your experience, do you have, first of all, have you had any experience or knowledge of uh, the success of metal backs containing fires within domestic fridge freezers? or domestic fridges for that matter? Um, only almost a layman's knowledge. Um, so there's been some work done uh, within the UK by the London Fire Brigade looking at um, the speed at which flames can develop uh, outside of or, or up against the back of um, fridge freezers, some of which are plastic backed and some of which are metal backed. Um, and those tests show uh, quite clearly, they're video tests and those te or videoed tests, and th those tests show quite clearly that um, the spread of the flame out of the appliance and up the back of it is is slowed down by having a metallic back. Now, I would note that the two tests are done where um, the fridge freezers that are being burnt are facing outwards, so they're not in a corner configuration or they're not placed in situ within a compartment. Um, and so it's uncertain as to how, 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 how much of a retarding effect in terms of flame growth uh, this would have in a, 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 a kitchen appliance placed within a kitchen, if you like. Thank you, Professor. Those are all the questions I've got for now. Sir, may I ask for the customary break to see if there are any other matters yes. which I haven't covered, which I ought to have done? Right. Well, Council needs a moment to check his questions. Um, we'll rise for five minutes to give him that opportunity. Okay.
So um, if you'd like to give the usher. Thank you. We'll come back in five minutes' time. Right, Mr. Kinder, I'll say 12 o'clock then. Uh, thank you, sir. Yes, thank you very much.
Well, we'll get the professor back, and you, then you can tell us what's in. Thanks, sir. What's in waiting? Professor? Yes, thank you. Well, I don't know if there are more questions. Perhaps there are today. One. One. Mm. Uh, thank you, Professor. First of all, mindful that you're not a forensic electrical engineer, was there anything in Dr. Glover's report or addendum that caused you to change your view, first of all, on area of origin? Sorry, could you say that again, please? Yes. You're not a forensic electrical engineer? Yes. Was there anything in Dr. Glover's report or addendum that caused you to change your view on First of all, area of origin. No. no. Again, was there anything in Dr. Glover's report or addendum that caused you to change your view that in relation to cause, it was electrical in origin? Um, it, it was electrical in nature. That in would nature. be how I would put it, yes. And there was nothing? No, sorry, I beg your pardon. No, there was nothing that caused me to change my view. I'm very grateful. Professor, that leaves me to say thank you very much for coming to give your evidence today. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Yes, well, it certainly is. I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of all of us for putting your undoubted expertise at our disposal, for writing these reports and for coming along to explain them to us. And we, thank we, you, sir. It's it very, been very interesting and very useful. Thank you very it, much. It was a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, that's it as far as you're concerned. And if you'd like to go with the usher, she'll look after you. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Well now, Mr. Kinnear. So, say for one matter, that concludes the evidence of today. The outstanding matter is that um, I am required to read in um, certain position statements that have been received by the inquiry. And if I may ask Ralph to draw up inquiry documents, that's INQ, quintuple zero, five double three, dash one. And so, may I formally read in the position statements of the MHCLG, the Home Office, the LFB, the Mayor of London, and RBKC, and the supporting end notes and exhibits. Thank you. And, and for the benefit of those who may be wondering what on earth you're doing, <coughs> these are position statements. Has been asked. <laughs> uh, position statements which have been provided by those bodies in response to a request from the inquiry to tell us what steps they've taken in response to the disaster. That's right, sir. And with that, that concludes today's evidence. Good. Well, thank you very much. So we'll break there. We'll sit again tomorrow at 10 o'clock when we'll hear uh, from another expert witness to the inquiry. Professor Persons. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. 10 o'clock tomorrow, please. <laughs>